Hello, and welcome to episode 5 of Sex Ed, that's sex with a CTS. I'm Patrick Reynolds. And I'm Michael Albany. And before we start talking about today's subject, did you know that Sex Ed has a website? By visiting www.sexed.com, not only can you listen to every episode of our podcast, but also find a plethora of resources to supplement your listening experience. We post show notes for each episode and blog posts to suggest further readings in case there are certain sex that you want to learn more about. You can also find the link to our RSS feed there uh, for those listening to Sex Ed on the go. But if you're like me and you don't use an RSS app, no worries, you can also subscribe to Sex Ed on iTunes and never miss an episode. With those housekeeping matters out of the way, though, I think it's time to get started, because today's show is going to be a little different, right, Patrick? That's right. Today we'll be talking about Native American religious traditions, specifically those espoused by a 19th century Shawnee prophet named Tenskwatawa. We'll be talking about how Tenskwatawa rose to become a religious and political leader, and what he and his followers believed, as well as how he came into conflict with the United States government, and the extent to which the War of 1812 can be thought of as a religious war. To do this, we've decided to invite to the podcast a good friend of ours named Adam Franti. Hi, uh, I'm a graduate student at Eastern Michigan University. I'm actually working on a thesis about the War of 1812, so this is pretty much right up in my wheelhouse. It's good well, to be here. All right, welcome to Sex Ed. So with three podcasters, we're mostly going to forgo the narrative style we usually employ here uh, and instead be a bit more conversational and unscripted. Nevertheless, uh, we have a lot to talk about with Tenzu and something you might be able to help us with, Adam, uh, is setting the stage for our conversation. So Tenzu was born in early 1775, and he was originally given the name, and he was originally given the name Lalawathika, meaning the rattle or the noisemaker. He was the youngest son of Pakenshua, a Shawnee warrior who, sadly, uh, Tenzu would never get the chance to meet. In 1774, war erupted in Indian country against the British colony of Virginia as Euro-American settlers began to encroach further into Shawnee hunting grounds in what is now Kentucky. The ensuing conflict, called Dunmore's War after the Virginia governor, ended at the Battle of Point Pleasant with Shawnee defeat and Pakenshawa losing his life. Within only a decade, though, Virginia would no longer be a colony, but instead a state in a newly formed nation. Given this radical geopolitical transformation, what kind of world would Tenzakwatawa have come of age in? Perhaps, Adam, you can talk about the relationships between the Americans and American Indians and what was referred to by the former as the Northwest Territory and the impact of such events as the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so following the, the American Revolution or the War for Independence, uh, Indian relations, especially in the Northwest Territory, which is you can kind of think of as a big... The Great Lakes region is a really good way of, of putting it. So pretty much Ohio, Indiana. Um, Indiana actually en encompassed parts of Illinois and Wisconsin at the time as well. It was a really big territory. Uh, in any case, uh, the, the diplomatic relationship between the Native Americans and the Americans was very strained. Uh, most Native Americans actually chose to fight alongside the British during the War for Independence for pretty good reasons. The British generally just looked out for the Native American interests. Uh, a lot better than most Americans did. Americans were interested in completely dominating the land. The British at that time had kind of changed their approach to colonization uh, to more favor trading relationships and political relationships with Native American leaders, warriors, and uh, various tribes. So in this kind of uh, this changing dynamic, you have the Iroquois Confederacy, which had long been allied with British interests and eventually American interests, starting to fade. And in that kind of power vacuum, you have uh, the Shawnee, who are becoming kind of the central figures of the old Northwest frontier. Shawnee language becomes kind of the lingua franca, uh, the trading language. Most fur traders who, you know, uh, aside from French, would speak Shawnee. Um, and they start to, to influence a lot of the tribes up here in Michigan as well. So we have the Odawa, the Ojibwe, and the Potawatomi, the three fires here in Michigan, are being influenced by a lot of uh, Shawnee traders, a lot of Shawnee uh, diplomats, religious leaders, and warriors uh, as well. And uh, the Americans obviously are looking at this as a problem. They see the, uh, the, the Ohio River Valley especially as a place where they want to uh, dominate. They want to move settlers into it. They see it as a very rich, fertile uh, land that can grow a lot of crops. They see it as something that people want to live in, obviously. So they have what people breaking treaties, moving into this territory and obviously violating treaties that the United States government had set up after the War for Independence. And this is a, uh, obviously making Shawnee pretty upset. Um, so there's a lot of uh, kind of low burning violence going on on both sides for uh, for quite a while. And in the 1790s, they actually have um, one of the first, not one of the first actually, uh, kind of a second religious awakening. Uh, 
uh, that they see. And one of the things that I'd like to stress kind of throughout the conversation that we have today is that Native Americans didn't necessarily see politics and religion uh, is different. They were part of kind of their same world conception, whereas modern Americans like to take everything and separate it. Right? We like to have our politics over here, our religion over here, um, personal relationships over here. Native Americans didn't really see it that way. Uh, a trading relationship was a personal re re relationship, um, and uh, religion was politics, was personal. It was all very interconnected in their worldview. So when you have a religious awakening that has political overtones, like we'll talk about with Tenskwatawa later, um, it, it has a really kind of strong and uniting and motivating factor. This is a, a pan-Indian um, kind of unification that's going on in the Ohio country. So, of course, Americans uh, look at this as an existential threat. They see if we allow this to happen, then we're never going to be able to exploit the land like we want to. So they send an expedition in 1790 under a guy named Harmar, and it fails. They send a second expedition under a guy named St. Clair in 1791, and the United States actually suffers its absolute worst defeat in history. Um, at the hands of this band of Indian warriors. Uh, after that, the United States government decides to kind of hand all of the responsibility for dealing with this Native American threat to a guy um, that we all probably are pretty familiar with, or at least have heard the name, Anthony Wayne. Mad Anthony Wayne, they called him. It took him about three years, but he eventually kind of uh, cobbled together an army, um, built a, a string of forts into the Ohio country, and defeated the, the uh, Indian Confederacy at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794. So this uh, kind of changes the, the scope of the political relationship in the region, uh, mostly because the Battle of Fallen Timbers, rather than defeating the Indian Confederacy, it was a pretty minor skirmish when you actually look at the numbers of troops involved, the, the length the battle actually took, and the casualties taken on both sides. It was actually a fairly small, relatively minor skirmish. Um, in any case, the British after this backed off. The British at, at the time had actually been kind of giving arms and support and promises of political support uh, to the Native American coalition. After the Battle of Fallen Timbers, um, Anthony Wayne actually confronted a British fort, Fort Miami, um, on the Maumee River, and uh, essentially surrounded it, put it under siege for a couple of days, and eventually the British backed off. They, they rescinded all the promises they had made to Native Americans and said, we won't interfere anymore. Now, putting yourself in the, in the shoes of the British at the time is pretty important because, I mean, what's going on in Europe at the time, the French are just starting uh, the wars that would become the Napoleonic Wars. These are the largest wars ever fought uh, in human history before the, the First World War. So this is a, a pretty major deal, and, and, and this kind of omnipresent threat of the British, uh, or the th French, rather, toward the British, um, influences a lot of what the British do in the lead up to the War of 1812. So this is the world that, that uh, Tenskwatawa would, would have been born into. There's a lot of tension uh, between the United States and Great Britain. Uh, both sides are trying to use Native Americans to kind of force the other to do what they want. Um, and the Native Americans obviously are not really having it. You know, these are people with agency. It's really hard to, to get that across without actually coming right out and saying it. But a lot of the histories that we have, unfortunately, are from the perspective of the British or the Americans or the French or whoever. And we tend to forget that Native Americans, like, they have, they understand what's going on. They have uh, a relationship with all of these people, and they know what they need to do in order to influence events. And they do it. Usually they're quite good at it. Um, so this is the world that Tenskwatawa, or Lala Wathika, is born into. And like you said earlier, he's considered kind of a useless drunk uh, for most of his life, unfortunately. Well, I think that clears up a lot about the geopolitical landscape of the region moving into the 19th century, but what about the spiritual landscape? For Algonquin-speaking Aboriginal groups living in the Old Northwest, what sort of spiritual beliefs uh, were ascribed to? Maybe uh, you two can speak a bit more about this. Sure, and I think uh, one of the things that Adam brought up, which is very helpful, is this understanding that for Native American groups, the worlds of politics and religion are not separate. They are interconnected in the same way that the spiritual world, uh, for many of the groups that we're talking about, the spiritual world is connected with the temporal world. Now, one of the things I want to stress is that Native American religion is not a monolithic category. Absolutely, uh, you have variations between the groups that we're talking about. So we're focusing on sort of the Algonquin-speaking groups who are located in the sort of Northwest Territory. And one of the major elements that you see recurring uh, is that of the Manitou. So essentially for, for indigenous peoples, Manitou would have been manifestations of both uh, animate and inanimate objects which could be interacted with on a sort of daily level. So uh, you could see animals or 
elements of nature. And basically, these were uh, elements that could be beneficial, could be detrimental, or could be neutral. But basically, the idea was that humans could interact with a sort of spiritual plane, and Manitou, as sort of manifestations of that plane, could impart benefits or detriments onto those that uh, could tap into that power. Anything else you want to add? Right, yeah. And uh, Manitou is uh, often translated as spirit, uh, and I think your explanation is a lot more nuanced and carries a lot more detail than just spirit. When we, when we as, as kind of modern white Americans think of spirit, it, it has totally different connotations that it would have had um, to a Native American. A Native American is going to look at a Manitou as something that is the expression of nature, right? It's the expression of something that is intrinsically powerful and intrinsically unknowable. And it could be benevolent, it could be malevolent, it could be neither, or it could be both. Um, and so knowing that, that Manitou is this very complicated thing, and knowing that personal relationships are, kind of dominate um, the, the aspect of Native American spirituality is, I think, a major kind of stepping stone in figuring out what people believed and, and what motivated them to act. Uh, this is something that a lot of white uh, missionaries, white people that were kind of trying to figure out what, what Native Americans were all about, really overlooked because they wanted to find something that looked like the Catholic Church. Uh, in the Native American territory, and of course nothing like that existed. Uh, it was a very kind of personal relationship. Um, personal charisma counted for a lot, so this is why we have people like prophets, like Naolin, uh, Tenskwatawa, became sort of a, a personal manifestation of these various Manitou because they were personally char charismatic. They could, tr they could translate all these forces into something that was knowable and actionable. Whereas, um, you know, before you might just look at this kind of mystery of, of the landscape and feel powerless. And I think prophets were, were a very important way of trying to take power over something like that. And it sounds like, um, I guess we should talk about the term uh, animism, even though that's outdated, but it's something that people might be familiar with. That sounds a lot like the Manitou concept in some ways, but yeah, definitely animism is an anthropological term that gets applied to a lot of really different traditions. So I don't know. I just wanted to bring that up because I'm sure people will think like, oh, it's animist, but right. it's right. sort of an outdated concept in a lot of ways. And of course, one of the things that you bring up, Adam, is this idea of Catholic missionaries coming into Indian country. And one of the ways that they have sort of a modicum of success is by recognizing that there are these things called Manitou, but one of the one of the complications that arises is their propensity to say, oh, well, you have these things called spirits. Well, we in the Catholic Church also have sort of this angelic pantheon. And of course, there is the God of all things, which they would have ascribed to the term Geechee Manitou. So you see that quite often, basically Catholic missionaries writing in their records that the Indians that we have encountered, they worship Geechee Manitou, who is like the Christian God. It is not obviously. But on the other end of things, uh, you see one of the reasons that Native Americans are able to incorporate elements of Christianity into their own cosmological views is because the Manitou are such a sort of complex and nuanced concept. You're able to incorporate elements of other religions sort of into your cosmology. Uh, basically, Christianity was not wrong from an indigenous standpoint. It was simply another way of visualizing interactions with Manitou or these sort of cosmological forces, which are manifestations of nature. Mm -hmm. I think one, one of the things we might uh, talk about later, but one of Tenskwatawa's sort of core principles was that there was uh, a certain conception of God or Gitche Manitou that was good for white people, and that was generally the, the Christian God. And then there was the, the aspect of God or Gitche Manitou that was good for native people. And preaching this kind of strict separation between the two and saying that there was a spiritual component to the separation of races was, was one of the things that Tenskwatawa really popularized when, when he sort of first rose to prominence. So these are the types of beliefs that Lali Wathika would have been intimately familiar with as he was growing. However, even though he belonged to a clan that traditionally produced Shawnee war leaders like Pukenshiwa, uh, his dad, by 1804, Lali Wathika bore little resemblance to a leader of any kind. He was easily recognizable as a figure in his community because when he was a child, he accidentally shot his right eye out while playing with a bow and arrow. We have a Christmas story. And while he may have been conspicuous, he was not popular. Um, he was not a particularly skilled hunter to the point where he couldn't provide for his wife and children, and he developed a reputation as an alcoholic. That all changed, though, sometime in the winter of 1804 or 1805, where he claimed to have received a vision from what he called the Master of Life, 
In this vision, he visited a crossroads. The left road led to a series of houses where people were being tortured, including alcoholics who were forced to drink molten lead. The right road led to a sweet-smelling field. The right road led to a sweet-smelling field filled with blooming flowers and plentiful game. When he awoke, Lalothika was a changed man. He swore off alcohol entirely and began to preach a new religious message to any indigenous people who could listen. Soon he garnered a reputation as a prophet and began to be referred to as Henskatawa, which means the open door. And this reminds me of a lot of the, some of the people we've covered already, uh, Marshall Applewhite and Mother Anne, who both had really severe low points in their life that marked the point where they transitioned into becoming uh, some manner of prophet, uh, although they called themselves different things. And also actually really reminds me of uh, the fictional character Aaron Greyjoy uh, from Song of Ice and Fire. I think the comparison between Mother Anne is especially appropriate because Mother Anne is one of these figures who is a part of a society which she is a marginalized figure in. And that marginalized status it is very much a consequence of her gender as well as her class. She is a woman who is brought up in sort of a working class environment. And for Tenzo Katawa, it's the same in the fact that he is not a skilled hunter. He can't provide. He is in a very desperate, destitute situation. And at this point, he sort of receives a vision and is able to reinvent himself. Like Hong Chi Kwan, too, which we're going to cover uh, at some point. Episode 10 uh, with the Taiping Rebellion. So what types of practices did Tenzo Kotawa endorse in his preaching? Well, the principal practice undergirding Tenzo Kotawa's religious philosophy was a complete separation of Native Americans from Euro-Americans. So Tenzo Kotawa wanted, yes, Indians to abstain from drinking alcohol, which Europeans introduced into indigenous communities, but he also wanted them to live separately from white people, not trade with white people, not even eat food that white people prepared. Now, Tenzo Kotawa did not write any of these decrees down. He instead opted to engage in the indigenous tradition of oral transmission. So most of what we know about Tenzo Kotawa's teachings comes from Euro-American observers who were writing down the sermons that his disciples delivered. Uh, in one such sermon, delivered by an Odawa named The Trout, Tenzo Kotawa made clear his beliefs about Americans especially. He claimed that the benevolent master of life did not create Americans, but they were instead, quote, the children of the evil spirit. They grew from the scum of the great water when it was troubled by the evil spirit, end quote. So this message arrived at the same time as Tenzo Kotawa's older brother, Tecumseh, was beginning to organize a pan-Indian confederacy to oppose the encroaching United States. So, Adam, perhaps you can tell us a bit more about Tecumseh, and what role did this Shawnee leader play in Tenzo Kotawa's life, and to what extent do you think he was influenced by his brother's teachings? Sure, of course. Um, Tecumseh is a name that most people would probably recognize. Um, I mean, there are places, I think in Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan, there's towns named Tecumseh. Um, in any case, Tecumseh rose to prominence in the first decade of the 19th century as uh, a Shawnee war leader, but it's not until about 1810 or so, or even uh, until the, the War of 1812 started, where Tecumseh starts being recognized as the dominant figure between the two brothers. Um, in a lot of the correspondence that we have from American leaders, Tenskwatawa, or the prophet, is the, is the person that they focus on. Um, we even have letters from Andrew Jackson and William Henry Harrison who, who call the prophet an engine of the British. They see that um, obviously Native Americans can't possibly organize something like this on their own. It must be the British behind it. So they have this kind of chauvinistic uh, relationship with Native Americans and to think they're, they can't think that, they can't come up with anything that complicated on their own. It must be manifestations of British power and British malfeasance in the continent, and they want to get that out of there. It's one of the big causes of the War of 1812. Uh, in any case, we don't know much about. The relationship between Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa, a lot of what we do know comes from well after the war, when the memory of the war becomes politicized. There's a man named C.C. Trowbridge who actually conducts an interview with Tenskwatawa in about the 1820s, and that's where a lot of what we know about uh, Tenskwatawa's life comes from, is Trowbridge is essentially trying to popularize William Henry Harrison as a presidential candidate. So of course there's a, there's a lot that we have to take for granted with uh, the writings from came well after the events. In any case, Tecumseh, when the war starts, is one of these guys that every single person who meets him is instantly charmed 
even even people who loathe the guy and loathe everything he stands for, like Harrison and like Andrew Jackson, say that you know he's tall and well built, he's handsome, he's charming, he speaks very well. Even if they don't understand what he's saying because he never spoke English, they can tell that he's got a lot of very personal charisma. So, what we have with Tenskwatawa and Tecumseh is this kind of age old relationship between a prophet and a warrior, and you have. Somebody who's basically taking the hard line, saying we're not going to drink alcohol. I think <laughs> followers of Tenskwatawa even start killing dogs in Indian villages because dogs had, they saw as coming from Europeans, um, and they have this very kind of hard line, very conservative, very back to basics um, spiritual framework. And then you have somebody like Tecumseh who realizes that well, we're not going to get rid of everything. Tecumseh still fights with muskets. He still you know equips his men with muskets, but he does it in a way that makes it popular, especially among young warriors who are kind of desperate to get out and fight. Uh, and so Tecumseh takes the message from his brother and transmutes it into something that's more politically actionable. And I think the, it wouldn't quite have worked quite as well if it was just Tenskwatawa. Tenskwatawa was definitely not uh, an idiot. There are a lot of stories about how he you know, almost ruined the entire movement and various times that are overblown and taken way out of context, in any case, were made up entirely. But Tecumseh was able to kind of take again, this religious spiritualism, and turn it into something that meant, you know, we can go out and, and fight for something. Uh, and that was very important. Uh, by around 1808, 1809, that was, that was the kind of glue that was holding this entire continent's worth of Native Americans together to oppose the Americans. And, and this was becoming something that Americans were getting very, very, very nervous about. I think it's important that you stress the sort of dynamic between a war leader and a religious leader. I think one of the still permeating viewpoints amongst most uh, understandings of Native American leadership is this idea of the quote-unquote chief. Like there was a chief that was the right. singular leader, and that's absolutely not how it worked. In fact, you would often have this sort of dynamic of an individual who who is the steward of these sort of spiritual relationships that indigenous peoples have. But then you also have that person who needs to keep in mind the sort of pragmatic realities of living in an environment where there are encroaching Euro-Americans and you can have this sort of belief structure which is based on complete separation. Nevertheless, there's still this active threat that needs to be taken care of. And that's sort of the role that Tecumseh fills, is this right. uh, basically making it so that there is a space that is safe enough for Tenzakwatawa's spiritual views to be practiced because he is a warrior and he's able to combat the Americans as a sort of language of violence that they understand. Right. So while both Tenzakutawa and Tecumseh advocated for pan-Indian unity, uh, that does not mean that Tenzakutawa would not push back against certain indigenous religious practices. Uh, at this point, it's time to talk about witch hunts. So Patrick, you're knowledgeable about the history of witches and witchcraft in the United States. Uh, do you think you could give us a brief overview of this tradition of witch hunting that would have been uh, that would have been around, that would have been known at least by the time the 19th century comes around? going to be hard to keep it brief, but yeah, I'll try. So some of the big misconceptions about witch hunting um, that I think people have, a lot of people associate it with medieval Europe, where it was actually not much of a thing. Actually believing in witches was itself heretical uh, up until quite late uh, in European history. It was it was after the invention of the printing press and the publication of the Malleus Maleficarum, the Hammer of Witches, that witch hunting really started to take off. But even when that was published, um, the authors were, were kicked out of the university um, and derided and actually the Spanish Inquisition at one point even was saying, you have to hunt people who believe in witches, not witches, because witches aren't real. But it was essentially went along with the rise of Protestantism, where both Catholics and Protestants started shifting their views, saying that there are evil witches out there and we need to find them. But it was a lot of mass hysteria. There's a lot of uh, just accusing people who are strange in the community in some way. Um, and it's also interesting with uh, Tenskwatawa, because a lot of the witch hunts in Europe and in the colonies that later became the United States, they're usually not a top-down uh, sort of authoritarian, we're going to hunt witches. It's uh, mob action, generally. It's, it bubbles up from uh, the lower levels of society and becomes a group that usually happens uh, sort of on the fringes in areas that are in conflict. And what's really interesting is it's often led by people who are themselves 
kind of strange uh, spiritually who have some unorthodox views. There's there's a whole concept that the clever folk, uh, as they were known in England, were persecuted as witches, but traditionally it's the people living out in the woods making the cures who are the people who believe in witches and get the crowds riled up to go hunt them. And in the United States, there's uh, obviously Salem, which we can probably do a whole episode on, but there's a history of uh, hunting witches before that. Essentially, it's uh, generally against some sort of outsiders in the community, also generally led by some sort of outsider in the community. And I think that is important for context because it's important to note that uh, there are those individuals who, even in the time period we're talking about, have this conviction that magical forces or uh, malevolent magical forces are real and that manifest and sometimes in the form of witches. So one of the figures that this sort of brings to mind is uh, a woman named Mal Pitcher who in the same sort of period we're talking about, late 18th, early 19th century, uh, is this sort of fortune teller, this sort of uh, woman who practices divination who is operating in New England and Massachusetts more specifically. And basically she was very well known, but you had this sort of belief amongst uh, many Americans, and I think this is very much uh, in it's very much uh, a part of the sort of separation of church and state that's very much a part of the uh, Jeffersonian moving into the Jacksonian tradition of this idea that yes, you should be Christian, nevertheless, manifestations of God in the form of like miracles and uh, things like that that's not something that usually happens, nevertheless. You have this one Mal Pitcher who is renowned as a fortune teller and she's known for having a gate in the front of her big house that was made of whale bones. So basically you could visit the town that she lived in in Massachusetts and you could say, I hear that there are some whale bones nearby and that's very interesting. I'd like to know where those are. So basically you could ask around town where she was without actually asking where she was. So it's very much out of fashion to be superstitious Nevertheless, you have these beliefs that are a part of the culture. Um, and, and this sort of reminds me, I think we talked about it a bit in the last episode on, on Heaven's Gate with the UFO belief, that there's these folk beliefs throughout history, um, whether it's UFOs or ghosts or witches, that are outside of whatever the mainstream religious traditions are. They're not a part of, uh, you know, Christianity doesn't really have anything talking about ghosts and hauntings or UFOs, but they're things that people believe in that end up intersecting with religion in, in strange ways. And belief that witches were real and that magic was real and that witches could hurt you was sort of one of these folk beliefs uh, that shifted more and more into mainstream religion in the United States and other places. In various Aboriginal communities in the United States, they had their own traditions of witch hunting, particularly in New England, uh, where it was customary, much like the sort of witch hunting traditions you talked about, Patrick, to associate unexplainable misfortunes with acts of witchcraft that were perpetrated by outsiders. So basically, indigenous communities would lob accusations of witchcraft against uh, Euro-Americans in some instances, uh, or even just peoples of other tribes or communities. Now, Tenzo Kutawa's teachings about witchcraft were a bit different. Uh, he lobbed accusations of witchcraft against those who used traditional medicine bundles. So according to him, when the Shawnee first arrived in their American homeland, they managed to kill an evil great serpent and some, however, harvested the pieces of the serpent's skin and they continued to inhabit the medicine bundles and impart great power, but dangerous power. So according to one 20th century historian, Tenzo Kotawa and his followers killed hundreds of supposed witches uh, in their crusade to end the use of medicine bundles. However, that's sort of a belief that is very much old 20th century. As more research has come about, uh, it's understood more that this was a very divisive issue. So Tenzo Kotawa was a figure who was able to influence these sort of witch hunts. Uh, nevertheless, in various communities, there, were, there was pushback against his sort of teachings. So we shouldn't consider that everything that Tenzo Kotawa said was taken at face value and adopted wholesale. There were uh, variations. So even though some of his teachings proved controversial, Tenzko Tawa managed to gain a substantial following, and he sought to consolidate his congregation into a place called Prophetstown. Tenzko Tawa chose to establish Prophetstown in close proximity to the Wabash River and the 18th century village of Tippecanoe. From a strategic standpoint, this was an excellent choice. 
Tippecanoe had been an Indian gathering place for years and had even become a commercial hub in the early 1700s since it was close to a French trading outpost and fort. The fort, however, was transferred to British control after the Seven Years' War, and in 1763 it was besieged by a widespread indigenous uprising, often associated with the Adawa war leader Pontiac. Now, when we say it was besieged, we're not comparing it to the more contentious engagements that occurred during that uprising, like the Fort Detroit or at Fort Pitt. What happened was that several local tribes basically called for a council with the British outside the fort, and they agreed, and they were captured without a single shot being fired. After Pontiac's uprising, the British decided not to garrison this fort again. However, with the United States now claiming the region, Tenskwatawa would come into conflict with the territorial governor, William Henry Harrison. Uh, Adam, do you think you could tell us a bit more about William Henry Harrison and what he thought of Tenskwatawa and Prophetstown? Um, so William Henry Harrison was one of these kind of classic Virginians that just permeate the American government, at least especially in the first 40, 50 years of its existence. Um, he came from a wealthy family. He was a planter. He was uh, very ambitious politically. Um, his father was a Revolutionary War veteran, and he was one of kind of the rising stars of this sort of new generation of American politicians that were trying to make their fortune, make their, their mark on the world as, as much as they could. He was appointed the governor of the Indiana Territory, which again was a massive, massive area. It was uh, parts of Ohio, parts of Indiana, parts of Illinois and Wisconsin, pretty much everything that isn't Michigan around the Great Lakes. And uh, it was his job essentially to, well, he saw it as his job to turn it into a state. One of the big problems with turning it into a state in uh, about 1806, 1807 when he was appointed was that the vast majority of people who lived there were not Euro-Americans. They were Native Americans. Uh, so he had to, to figure out how exactly to go about doing that. So Harrison was pretty clever. He was actually very popular when he was first appointed. But a lot of his policies became very, very divisive very quickly. Um, to, to illustrate kind of the kind of man he was, uh, when he was first appointed, uh, because of the Northwest Ordinance, slavery was illegal in the Indiana Territory. But to sidestep this issue, and because William Henry Harrison wanted a lot more of his planter friends from Virginia to come up to Indiana, um, he basically said that if you bring your slaves, they'll have to be freed as soon as they get into Indiana, but they'll be placed into an indenture contract lasting 99 years. So slavery by another name, essentially. Um, and, and in doing so, he attracted quite a lot of this, the, the kind of people that he wanted to come into uh, Indiana. And this obviously led to conflict. So when Tenskwatawa sets up Prophetstown, he deliberately sets it about five miles uh, to the east of the treaty line from the Treaty of Greenville that was signed after the Battle of Fallen Timbers back in 1794. So this is essentially a thumb in the eye from T Tenskwatawa to William Henry Harrison saying, I'm deliberately violating your treaty. What are you going to do about it? So Harrison obviously sees this as, as again, a threat to his power. Uh, he sees it as a threat to his popularity. If he doesn't deal with this very quickly, it's going to spiral out of control and he's going to lose the governorship. So he essentially builds himself a personal army, sort of asking for permission afterward, uh, and marches on Prophetstown. So the battle itself was, like a lot of these frontier battles that end up becoming very popularized, uh, pretty non-important uh, in the overall scheme of things. Um, Harrison actually marched out, uh, sort of camped very close to Prophetstown, and then just waited. That night, Tenskwatawa actually led warriors out um, and started shooting at, at pickets, uh, started shooting at the lines. Everybody panicked, and um, the, uh, the regulars in the American force formed a square. The militia, by various accounts, were running around, sort of getting in the way and not doing anything. Um, there's quite a lot of story there as well, but not really conducive to the point here. But in any case, the, the battle was kind of a mess, and the Americans claimed that they won because they were on the field the next day. Um, the Native Americans, on the other hand, were forced to retreat because they had run out of ammunition. And they left Prophetstown. The next day, Harrison marched into Prophetstown and burned the place down. Claimed that it was this signal victory, this huge thing that ended the Pan-Indian movement uh, in the Northwest Territory for, you know, the next how many years. And, of course, this is in uh, November of 1811, so this is on the eve of the War of 1812. This is on the eve of one of the largest Pan-Indian uprisings in history. And Harrison right now just sort of claims, oh, yeah, I totally won. Um, so obviously the relationship between Harrison and Tenskwatawa was deeply personal. I mean, these people might not have met that often, but they knew each other um, at a very personal level and considered themselves enemies uh, and, and you know, made it a point to um, challenge each other. 
I think one of the more entertaining stories I've heard about it is when um, Harrison actually basically point blank asked Tenskwatawa to prove that he was a prophet. He said, well, you know, if you, if you can speak to the great spirit, prove it. And Tenskwatawa predicted uh, a comet in the sky or a meteor in the sky at, at one point. And uh, it happened, you know, and we don't know how, uh, how he knew this or why, but it, it absolutely happened. He came out of his tent, raised his arms, and, you know, in the sky above there was, this, uh, there was this meteor that he had predicted. And it made Harrison look like a fool, of course, and Harrison, of course, got very, very angry. And that's what kind of started this personal retributive crusade that he went on against Tenskwatawa. And, of course, the battle you're referring to, the Battle of Tippecanoe, which, despite the fact that it was, in essence, a battle of little consequence in the sense that uh, it did not bring an end to the pan-Indian Confederacy as William Henry Harrison made it appear, it is sort of one of the defining aspects of his political career to the point where when he uh, runs for president in 1840, that's his platform, Tippecanoe and Tyler II, uh, referring to his vice president, of course. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, uh, if you know about William Henry Harrison, I think most people are aware of the fact that he died uh, very quickly. How long was it? He was in days. office a month. Yeah. yeah. And there's actually a, a uh, sort of urban myth surrounding uh, Tenzakutawa and the fact that there is a curse surrounding him. So William Henry Harrison, he has a history which not a lot of people know because any of the things that he was involved in prior to his presidency are dwarfed by the fact that he is our shortest serving president. He dies after approximately 30 days. Uh, well, there's an urban legend that his death was a direct result of Tenzakutawa. Basically, uh, when William Henry Harrison was elected, a sort of curse was put on him. And not just William Henry Harrison, but get this, every American president elected in a year that ends with a zero. And in fact, every American president who has been elected with a year ending in a zero, which is every 20 years, has died while in office. We have Harrison dying in 1840 of natural causes, about 30 days in. 1860, of course, Abraham Lincoln assassinated in his second term. 1880, uh, we have President Garfield, who was assassinated in his first term. Um, 1900, William McKinley, who I believe was assassinated in his second term. Um, you had, in 1820, uh, President Harding, who died of perhaps natural causes. We don't know because after he died, his wife sort of just requested the body before an, an autopsy could be performed. That's right, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 1940, um, you had Roosevelt elected, and he, of course, dies of natural causes, causes in his fourth term. 1960, Kennedy was assassinated, and then the curse was apparently broken in 1980 when Reagan survived his assassination attempt. So this is just one of those bits of, uh, one of these bits of urban myth, much the same as, did you know that Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy, and Kennedy had a secretary named Lincoln, which I think was a Ripley's Believe It or Not story yeah. that is actually not true, um, but it is... It is an intriguing point. Well, for the next bar trivia night, right. we'll have it's useless information to know. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so the Battle of Tippecanoe did not usher in the end of Tenskwatawa. In many ways, uh, it can be considered a prelude for a much larger conflict that erupted the next year between the United States, Great Britain, uh, and Tecumseh's Pan-Indian Confederacy. The Native Americans were actually a really major pivotal players in the War of 1812. They were instrumental allies for the British. And it's because of these indigenous allies that on July 17th, 1812, a ragtag assortment of British irregulars under the command of Captain Charles Roberts were able to capture the American fort on Mackinac Island in the opening days of the war simply by threatening an effusion of blood if the United States did not unconditionally surrender. A band of warriors commanded by Tecumseh himself were equally effective at striking fear into the Americans at Fort Detroit, delivering the British a substantial victory. However, this isn't a military history podcast. Um, what we want to know, Adam, is where Tenskwatawa fits into all of this. Did the Native American warriors fighting in the War of 1812 have his spiritual guidance on their minds? And if so, to what extent can we consider the War of 1812 to be a religious war? Well, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier about the fact that, that the religious and, and political spheres in the Native American kind of concept of the world can't really be neatly separated. Um, whereas he William Henry Harrison might consider his deism something completely separate from his political career. 
Um, Tenskwatawa, Tecumseh, and, and the various warriors that were united by him, you mentioned the, the Odawa um, lieutenant, I suppose you can call him, Trout. Um, he was definitely a spiritual leader, uh, but he was also a warrior. Uh, Tenskwatawa was also considered a warrior. He, after Tecumseh died, uh, Tenskwatawa was sort of unanimously considered, you know, the chief of, of this various Pan-Indian uh, confederacy. Uh, he was considered the spiritual and the war leader, which doesn't happen very often. So I think, you know, the, the motivation for the separation, the motivation for uniting um, Native Americans together was definitely religious, but it also had actionable politics attached to it. Um, so this is in part what Tecumseh's role was, was to, again, take these political teachings or take these religious teachings and make them something that you can actually work at um, in the sense of the encroaching Americans and the, the British that you can't really rely on. Um, and I think very early on in the conflict, uh, like you mentioned, the fall of Mackinac, uh, the se seizure of Fort Detroit, um, Tecumseh actually personally met Isaac Brock, who was the guy who was in charge of the Canadian forces at the time. And the two of them actually hit it off. And if you ask any Canadian, they'll probably tell you all you ever want to know about Tecumseh and Brock and this kind of famous short-lived friendship that they actually had. But I think that speaks to more of what the conflict was about. Um, it's, a, it's about uniting um, Native Americans with all these various kind of conflicting interests and pushing them in, in one direction or another. And if it took that kind of spark of really religiosity to get that going, I think that's kind of the more critical factor. And again, you see that this very hard line that Tecumseh sets very early on being softened when Tecumseh steps in and sort of assumes the leadership role. So I don't necessarily think that it, this was an army of religious fanatics. Um, fanaticism is something that is difficult to recognize in Native American spiritualism because of the various things we talked about already. But there was definitely a religious aspect to the entire move toward Pan-Indian unity. And you see it in every single subsequent attempt after the War of 1812 to unify. You've got a war leader and a religious leader acting in concert. Uh, every, every time it happened before, you mentioned Pontiac's War, the same thing. You have this uh, prophet named Nao Lin who's preaching a certain kind of conservative hard line. You have a warrior who takes over and makes it actionable. So I think in that respect, it, it is definitely a religious war um, in the Native American conception of religious. This is not something that we could consider like the Crusades uh, in European history. It's not something that we can consider um, necessarily something that is fundamentally only religious. It is part of the whole kind of political worldview that Native Americans have. So I do think it is a religious war uh, in that respect, and it was certainly motivated by these awakening awakened teachings of Tenskwatawa, uh, certainly. And with that, I think the only appropriate way to close out this story would be to address how the lives of some of its central figures uh, we've been talking about come to a close. So, Adam, do you think you can tell us what became of Tecumseh, William Henry Harrison, and, of course, Tenskwatawa? Yeah. Um, so the War of 1812 became kind of a seminal event in all three of their lives. Um, Tecumseh, unfortunately, was the first one to get killed. Uh, he was actually killed at the Battle of the Thames in 1813, um, some people claim that William Henry Harrison himself was the guy that pulled the trigger, but uh, it's really difficult to know for sure, and that is a, a nuance we don't really need to get into here. Nevertheless, William Henry Harrison was in charge of the army that was fighting at the Battle of the Thames, or Moravian Town, and uh, Tecumseh was killed, uh, unfortunately. And this was, is often cited as kind of the breakup of the Indian Confederacy, but as I've mentioned before, Tenskwatawa essentially took over, and he was still very popular, he was still a very well-regarded leader, and the Confederacy didn't really break up uh, necessarily. They were still actually a very powerful factor in a lot of the battles that happened subsequently, but uh, their power was diminishing, uh, mostly because more British regulars were coming in. The British had to rely on them less and less and less. Um, in any case, Tecumseh was the first one to die. Um, Tenskwatawa, on the other hand, lived well after the War of 1812. He actually died in 1836. Uh, and this is after... He falls from prominence after uh, the, the sort of the Anglo-Indian alliance is defeated in the War of 1812, regardless of whether or not you consider the British losing the War of 1812, which is, again, an entirely different matter. Um, but the, the Native Americans are commonly regarded as the, the only real losers of the War of 1812. Um, all of their kind of political ambitions were quashed, and this ushered in the conception, or at least the staging ground for the idea of, of you know, American exceptionalism uh, and this idea of um, manifest destiny that seizes the American spirit uh, after the war. And if Americans had lost the War of 1812, we may not have even had that as a political conception. But again, it's a totally different story. So Tecumseh loses prominence after the war. 
And in various attempts to kind of regain that prominence, he starts working with Americans and he actually starts supporting uh, various removal um, efforts that are popularized by Andrew Jackson. Uh, even the territorial governor of Michigan, Louis Cass, um, actually reaches out to, to come, uh, Tenskwatawa at a certain point to ask him to come up and preach to various tribes in Michigan to get them to agree to, to move out west. Um, and he starts, he does this. He does this for a few years, kind of going around this, you know, almost like station stop tour, uh, <laughs> preaching for removal. Uh, and he eventually sort of dies in relative obscurity in 1836. Um, and by then, nobody's really paying attention. But this is also around the same time that William Henry Harrison is becoming another political figure again. After the War of 1812, he kind of just disappears. We have uh, in the American kind of political um, scene they call it the era of good feelings. And guys like Harrison just don't really fit in that mold anymore. After Jackson, of course, comes in and changes the political landscape again, then people um, start... Jackson really kind of popularized the notion of running for president, running for political office based on his war exploits. And of course, the, the War of 1812 was a really big factor in his election. So Harrison kind of follows in the same mold. Um, he starts running based on his reputation. He, like you said before, he has, you know, Tippecanoe and Tyler too. He's running based on his reputation as an Indian fighter and as a very kind of nationalist American. And it fits in this kind of new identity of Americans as you know, rugged individuals, this manifest destiny spirit that's seizing the country and everything, and he, he becomes very popular. So, of course, he's elected president in 1840, and like we've mentioned before, he dies about a month later. The popular story being that he gave a speech of, you know, great length when it was raining, and he was only wearing a shirt, and as far as I can tell, that's a, again, totally made-up story. He, he got a cold, um, but I don't think that had much to do with the speech that he gave, because he died a month later, and colds don't last that long. Um, but anyway, he was the sort of the last survivor of, of this kind of triumvirate of people that we've talked about before. Um, and uh, he was definitely the, the only one to kind of make, uh, make good on his reputation from the War of 1812. And a lot of it was because of the sort of propaganda that he issued pretty much immediately after all of these victories that he had had on the field that at the time weren't very major. But uh, in the remembrance, in the memory of it, they become much, much, much bigger factors in uh, especially American politics. Thank you, Adam, for joining us on this episode of Sex Ed. Uh, if anyone's looking to contact you or you know follow you on social media, what would be the best way to do it? Uh, I'm on Facebook. My name's Adam Franti, or uh, you can reach me through uh, email if you like. It's adam.franti at gmail.com. Well, thank you once again, and for anyone looking to contact us, you can do so through our website or email uh, at sexed at gmail.com, uh, where we accept questions, comments, concerns, and suggestions for future episodes. To keep up with the latest happenings from Sex Ed, you can also follow us at Sex Ed on Facebook and Twitter. And finally, if you like our show, help it grow. Share Sex Ed with a friend or family member today. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, Sex Ed is created under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It was recorded at LEADER, the Lab for the Education and Advancement in Digital Research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.